If you'd like to open your Bible up to the book of Titus, we're going to be doing some reading from that book as we begin. Titus chapter 1. As you turn there, let me just say it is so good to see each one that's here this morning. We have got just a number of visitors with us and appreciate your presence. And uh, I've gotten a chance to meet several of you. Those of you visiting with us that I didn't get to speak to ahead of time, I apologize for that and I hope to do so afterwards. But we're glad you're here. Thankful for the presence of all. And I ask you to turn to Titus 1 because here in Titus 1, Paul quotes from a Greek poet or a Cretan poet from about 600 B.C. His name was Epimenides. And it's interesting what he said. Verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Wow, that's a real compliment to a people, isn't it? Notice what Paul said next. This testimony is true. Paul said, when Epimenides summed you up, is a bunch of lying, evil, lazy folks. He wasn't lying about that. And in my Bible, the book of Titus covers less than a page and a half. And yet it's amazing to me how many times in these few verses he speaks of good works. And I've wondered many times, did the typical nature of the Cretans enter into that? that they were a people who tended to be lazy. And so he would say in verse 8, for example, or verse 7, to the young men, to show yourself a pattern of good works. In the 14th verse, he says to be zealous for good works. In chapter 3, in verse 1, at the last phrase, be ready for every good work. Chapter 3, verse 8. I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Verse 14. And let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs that they may not be unfruitful. Maybe it wasn't their background, but that There's a lot of emphasis being placed in these few verses on you need to be busy doing good things, meeting urgent needs. And I want us to think about that. Now, in this same book, he makes it clear, you know, it's not that you're going to do enough good works. You know, we've got our ledger sheet and I'm keeping count. And when I reach a certain point, I can say, well, now I'll be saved. Look at verse 4, beginning of the third chapter. He has just spoken of how we once were involved in sin. He said, but things changed. What changed? But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're not saved because of the works of righteousness we have done. We're saved by God's grace. But back up to the second chapter and look at the nature of that grace. Verse 11 For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. There's a universal nature to that. But then he says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself 
His own special people, zealous for good works. The grace that brings salvation, the grace that has appeared to all men, the grace that brings hope, is also a grace that teaches and says to us that we have to do certain things. In fact, I think it's an interesting contrast in light of how people view things today. In verse 5, he contrasts works of righteousness on one hand with the washing of regeneration on another. You can't read through the book of Acts. You can't read the Great Commission and not appreciate the fact the washing of regeneration is a reference to baptism that Jesus said, go and preach to all the world. There are people who say, oh, we can't be saved by works, so so baptism's not vital. Paul doesn't consider baptism a work of our own righteousness. It's a reflection of God's grace that He offers us this that we can do, that we meet Him on His terms and we can be saved. But the thing that's emphasized here is not the initial coming to salvation, but what do we do after that? We are to be a people zealous for good works. And I want to tell you, this encompasses a lot of things. But I want to emphasize, as he would say at at the end of the book in verse 14, to maintain good works to meet urgent needs the kind of good works that are done for others, that we do benevolent acts, encouraging things. We do things to help others. And I want to begin by talking about two women. And I deliberately use them because I hope they serve to illustrate a point I want to drive home. In the New Testament... Women are not those who would be, they were not chosen to be the apostles. All of them were male. When he came to talking about the organization and leadership of local churches, the bishop, the elder, was to be the husband of one wife, to be a male. We read restrictions in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Timothy 2. You know, so you think about this, there are limitations placed on the roles of women within the church. And yet, there are two women I want us to look at that were noted for their good works. And it's it's not just a point for women. Some men may be limited in their public leadership abilities, their public service. Nobody should ever feel restricted in their ability to be zealous for good works. All of us can do things. You know, it may not, we may not have the money to give the gen- which is generously as some, but there will be something we can do. All of us can be zealous for good works. I'm turning my Bible now to Mark, the 14th chapter. I invite you to do the same thing. Mark 14 is a story about Mary. Now, she's not identified by name here. We find that in John 12. Mary in the New Testament is a name that, you know, it's about like the name Jacob today, you know. Every year I see that Jacob is the most popular boy's name. I don't get it. John's a much better name, but that's another story, you know. In the New Testament, Mary was that name. Uh, she, that was a very popular name. This is Mary the sister of Martha and Lazarus. And in verse 3, Jesus, it's near the time of the cross, and it says, And being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came, having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard. Then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. But there were some who were indignant among themselves and said, Why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. 
And they criticized her sharply. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not have always. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. You might note verse 9, we're supposed to be telling this story. People are supposed to be remembering what she did. But she took this oil, costly oil, and poured it on his head. The first thing I want to notice is kind of a sad note. Some began to criticize sharply. If you read the other accounts, it's the disciples. It specifically says the disciples criticized her. If you take John 12, you find out Judas was the leader in instigating the murmuring of the disciples. You do good things for others. You do kind deeds. Sometimes you come in for some criticism. You know, I, that can happen. Do it anyway. Jesus didn't criticize. Jesus valued what she had done. She has done a good work for me. I sometimes hear people take verse 7 almost as dismissive of assisting the poor. That's not what Jesus said. He said there will be other opportunities to help the poor. You know, but the time to help me is limited. And she's done what she could. And I, I think about that phrase. She has done what she could. In one sense, if we accept their estimate of the value of this, what she did, it, it cost her a lot of money. I mean, it says in verse 3, it was very costly oil. If it was worth, as they said, more than 300 denarii, you're talking about the amount of money it would take an average working man more than a year to earn. It was an expensive gift. And yet, look at how he says, she's done what she could. A few days later, Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be spat upon. He will be blindfolded and he will be beaten. He will be scourged. He will be crucified. And let me ask you, what impact does Mary's pouring oil on his head have on any of that? You know, in the grand big picture... Does she change anything about the suffering of Jesus? Not really. And yet on that occasion, she offered honor and support. And Jesus appreciated it. In Mark the 10th chapter, Jesus made a statement, hence the picture that I, I've got up here. Whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. I don't even want to encourage anybody to think, hey, let's get by with as little as possible. You know, I could easily buy them a Coke, but a bottle of water is cheaper, you know, and Jesus said, you know, a cup of cold water. That, that's not the point. But what Jesus is saying is no good deed. No matter how small, done in the name of disciple goes unnoticed. And sometimes those small things mean a lot to people. Maybe it's a card. Maybe it's a phone call when somebody really needs it. Just a text that says, I'm thinking of you, praying for you. Maybe mowing someone's lawn, taking some food by. 
Just a kind word, a word of encouragement. Only a cup of cold water sometimes means a lot to people. I want to encourage us. Be more aware of those who need that kind of thing. We don't always know the situations. You know, so hey, spread it around and, you know, maybe you'll do something for somebody that really needed it that you didn't even realize needed it. But have the feelers up. See those people that you can tell need some good deed done. Maybe you can tell there's a financial need. Maybe you can see there's a need for something in their home, wherever it may be. And I want to challenge us all to be aware of people outside our circles. You know, we, we do tend, even within the church, to congregate to those that share common interest, those of the same age. You know, we get a little older, we sit around and we talk about how it used to be and, you know, all the afflictions we have and sometimes we may forget it's not easy to be a teenager. It's not easy to be a, a young single in your 20s or a young parent in your 20s and 30s. And we forget sometimes the encouragement they need. And sometimes young people may forget the older people and the fact that a lot of them, if you get it to a certain age, every one of them deals with health issues. They've dealt with losses. You know, some of them with the loneliness of having lost a spouse. You know, look around you and see who needs a cup of cold water. And then I want you to turn to Acts, the ninth chapter, to a woman named Dorcas. Her name was Dorcas also known as Tabitha. And the two names both meant gazelle. Beautiful, graceful animal. But let's pick up at verse 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full, notice this, was full of good works and charitable deeds which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. When he called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. Verse 42 is probably the main point that we're supposed to take from this. The fact that the power of Jesus in this apostle was able to raise the dead and it confirmed what he was saying was the word of God and it led to faith. That, that's probably the main point. And yet, the inspired writer here wants us to make sure we see something about this lady. She was full of good works and charitable deeds. The widows, as they wept, they said, look at these things that she made. These gifts that she made for us. She was a kind, caring, benevolent kind of person. And people remembered that. And, and as I said earlier, or alluded to, you know, Dorcas would never be, have been the preacher. She wasn't one of the elders there at Joppa. But she was a disciple who found a place in the hearts of those people because she was so kind 
and so charitable. I made the point earlier, and I think we have to understand this. Sometimes our good deeds are not appreciated. You know, the cynical old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Well, there are times we will feel the sting of that. But more times than not, if we are a people given to good works, full of good works and charitable deeds, in general, we will be like Dorcas. We'll be appreciated and we'll be loved. Let's think about some reasons. Why should we be like them, full of good works, zealous for good works? Well, I've got four sub points under this, but they're really one great big point. And it's simply this, as we've already seen from Titus 2, God commands us. His grace came teaching us to be zealous for good works. You know, people by nature tend to be somewhat inward focused. Inward focused is a nice way for saying sometimes we're a bit selfish. You know, that we, and I mean, we've got a self-preservation instinct that I believe God placed in us. You know, when certain things happen, I mean, you know, I, I'm fascinated by weather, bad weather. You know, I sometimes like to get out and watch the storms coming. One day I'm standing out there and lightning strikes in my neighborhood and found out later it actually hit somebody's back deck and did some damage it took me about mm, half a second to get inside the house when that happened you know uh when I saw that lightning streak come down and I heard that boom and I'm like I'm done you know there's that within us and that's okay but what God calls on me to do is to look outside myself in the old testament law Jesus said Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. 39 after loving God, the second greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. We say, well, that's the Old Testament. He repeats that in John, I mean, Romans 13. He repeats it in Galatians 5. To love your neighbor as yourself. You know, I'm, I'm, I care about myself. I want to protect myself. I want good things for myself. If I love my neighbor as myself, that's what I want for him. God says I have to do that. Jesus taught us to cast off that outer garment and to wash feet in John 13. To be a servant. And that just goes, you can't be a disciple without it. I mean, we, our theme for this year is about being conformed to the image of Christ. That's Romans 8 and verse 29. Predestination, as some teach it, I, I don't believe is true. That is that God decided before you were ever born whether or not you'd be saved. No. But God did have a plan He predestined. And that plan was to one day have a people who would be conformed to the image of His Son, Romans 8, 29. Who, as 2 Corinthians 3.18 said, would look upon the image of Christ and be transformed into that image. That would, 1 John 2.6, walk as He walked. How did Jesus walk? Well, Acts 10.38, Peter summed it up this way. He said He went about doing good. Now, He did things for people I can't do. You know, somebody comes to me and they can't see. I can't lay hands on them and give them sight. I certainly can't be like he did for the widow at Nain who raised her son up from the dead. But I can imitate Jesus in my care for people. Often in the scriptures it will note that he was compassionate. He was moved with compassion. That he took time to be with the little children. He took time for that Samaritan woman. That He took time for people. Jesus was a servant. I need to be the same way if I'm going to be a disciple. 
And I would also say this. Besides the fact that it's a commandment, God wants the best for us. In Acts, the 20th chapter, I want to back up to verse 33 before I get to the verse that I really want. But I want you to see a little context. Paul's talking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And he said, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that He said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. I can remember as a child hearing that said and really struggling to feel that way. Because I'll tell you something, I liked getting Christmas presents and birthday presents a whole lot more than I like giving them to somebody. You know. But Jesus is, what he says is true. There is a greater satisfaction in having done for someone than someone having done for you. That doesn't mean there aren't times you need that pickup. You know, somebody to lift you up. But there is a blessedness in this. And I think the more we become like Jesus, one, you know, when we do for others, we know that we have done what He wanted. We know that that's a step in becoming more like Him. And that provides us satisfaction. But when we see people who genuinely are appreciative, it does feel good. And then, I mean... I mean, this ought to be apparent, but if we don't, we'll be lost. Look at Matthew 25, one of the most sobering texts in Scripture. The Son of Man comes in His glory, and He's picturing the judgment, and and it's not intended to be the full picture, but He tells some, verse 34, Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick and in pri- or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. When you did these good works for them, it was for me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. We don't really have a choice about this. If we want to be disciples who inherit the kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world, we'll be zealous for good works. On the other hand, if we want the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels, then we won't. Last question I want to raise this morning real quickly is for whom should we do these good deeds? Who should we be nice to? You know, help, give a cup of cold water, perform some charitable work. Well, the Bible teaches, I believe, that we have a special obligation to our spiritual family. 
Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, and especially to those of the household of faith. Matthew 25 may well be in that same vein. Because you notice he said in verse 40, to one of the least of these, my brethren. Jesus may have used brethren there in a more comprehensive sense of all humanity. But I tend to think the reference to prison is explained by Hebrews 13, 3. Where the writer there says, do you remember those that are in chains? You're in the same body with them. He's talking about first century prison was bad. Far worse than today. Prison today is not good. But it was far more miserable. And when your brethren are persecuted, cast into prison, help them out. But make sure, as James 2 verse 1 says, that you don't hold the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. The good deeds for your brethren are for all your brethren. We know that, but how about Matthew 5? Uh, Don't you wish he hadn't said this sometimes? You know, I mean, I think all of us, if we're honest, we'd say, I wish Jesus hadn't said this. But he did. And I need to learn to think like Jesus and feel the way Jesus felt. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus loved us when we were enemies. That's the point made in Romans 5. If Jesus could love me when I was everything that was counter to what he wanted me to be, I'm supposed to love others, to do good to them. Romans 12, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. But they don't deserve it. No, they don't. We didn't deserve God's grace either. We've got to show it. Let me just say it this way. Who do we do good deeds for? We do good deeds for those who need it. Look at Luke, the 10th chapter. Just an intriguing little story here to me. Everybody knows the parable of the Good Samaritan. But it's the setup. The lawyer is trying to test him, verse 25. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus turns to him and he said, well, you know, you're a law expert. How do you read the law? Well, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Man knew the law. Jesus very just simply said, You've answered rightly. Do this and you will live. If you will truly love God, as God defines it, you'll love your neighbor, that'll be great. Well, I think he felt embarrassed. So he wanted to justify himself. And he said, well, now exactly who is my neighbor? You know, when you say help my neighbor, is that my fellow Jew, my fellow righteous Jew, you know, Pharisees, they had some things about not being seen with a woman. So you know, maybe it's only the male. Who knows what all he was thinking. You know, Jesus tells the story. The man is wounded, robbed on his way to Jericho. A priest came along, just passed on by. A Levite passed on by. Then a Samaritan, a man they would have scorned, when he saw him, he had compassion. 
He bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on the wounds. Put him on his animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. Now watch the question. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? The man's question started out is, who is my neighbor? Jesus' answer is, who can you be a neighbor to? And there's a difference. Who can you be a neighbor to? Somebody that needs you. Somebody that needs your help. It may be physical, financial, emotional, spiritual. It it can be so many things. Who needs you? Be his neighbor. Have a special concern for the needy, the oppressed, the afflicted. You see this so often through the prophets. But in James 1.27 Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Really, throughout Scripture, orphans and widows tend to stand for those in desperate straits. There was no social security. You know, there were no, none of the welfare programs that we would see today. To be a widow, to be an orphan, was often to be in desperate straits. It was to suffer. You know, I think that the social welfare programs of our day, you know, just the general prosperity of our society, have reduced some of these needs, but they've not eliminated them. We're going to encounter from time to time people who need help, who are like the orphan and widow, to visit here. This is not a word that means just to go by and see. It's a word that suggested attending to their needs. Often in the Old Testament it's like God has visited His people. God had come to help His people to deliver. Be aware. It may be your brethren. It may be a neighbor down the street. Maybe whomever. Be aware of those things. I don't want us to be like those people of Crete who were lazy. I want us to be a people zealous for good works. You go back to Titus 2. Notice what it says at verse 14, the very beginning who gave himself for us. I'm not zealous for good works because, well, I'm keeping a ledger. And I want to come in here on Wednesday night and show you, I got more on my page than I bet than you do. Or I've got enough on here that I can show to God and say, woo, look at me. No. But because he gave himself for me, he died on that cross for me, I, in turn, Nathan talked about being a living sacrifice for God. Part of that living sacrifice is that I give myself to others and do for others. Be motivated by that mercy that saves. Verse 4, the kindness and love of God our Savior. Verse 5, His mercy Verse 7, His grace. These are things that ought to motivate us. He mentioned in verse 5 that washing of regeneration. Based on Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I'm convinced this is a reference to baptism. As we close this morning, our lesson is focused on what you do after you become a Christian. But if you've never done this to become a Christian, 
we'd be glad to help you. If you just come as we stand and sing together. Thank you for watching this video. We're glad that you have found our channel. And in fact, while you're here, we would encourage you to subscribe to the Jones Road Church of Christ channel. We have several videos already up. And we believe you'll find these to be true to God's word, helpful to you in your journey toward God. And if you have any questions, please reach out to us and let us know how we can help you.